Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's program of the 2021 New York International Children's Film Festival. We do programming all year round and we are super excited about today's conversation and look behind the scenes at what is currently the top film on Netflix, the new animated feature Vivo. My name is Maria Cristina Villaseñor. I'm the programming director at the New York International Children's Film Festival. And we're so excited to be able to have this conversation with the film's brilliant director, Kirk D'Amico, and also the wonderfully talented voice actor, Inarli Simo. Um, it's gonna be a great conversation. Um, we're gonna take a look at the making of and also make sure that we get some questions for you fielded so that you can speak to um, these great talents directly and learn all about the making of this wonderful new film. Um, so um, thanks very much to Netflix for making this conversation possible. Um, we're super excited to be bringing this title and this um, Sony Pictures animation, another wonderful creation from them. Um, to you all. Um, lots of people know about it already, obviously, and we hope that you share this conversation and um, spread the word about the film as well. Um, before we introduce our wonderful director and voice actor, I just wanna um, go through some thank yous. Um, as you may know, um, Night GIF is a year round nonprofit organization. Um, we work hard to present films that challenge stereotypes spark conversation and inspire creativity. I mean, we do that in all kinds of ways through our annual film festival, through talks like these, through our film ed classroom program. Um, and we are so grateful to all of our uh, folks out there who make things possible, to our sponsors, to our funders, to our members, to all of you that work in so many ways to support us. So thank you, thank you. Um, and, um, you know, go online to nikif.org and you can check out all that we do um, and look into becoming a member if you aren't already. All right, without further ado, I am so excited to welcome director Kirk D'Amico. Kirk, hello. Hi, nice to see you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for, ha for having you here. And now also joining us, voice actor Inarli Simon. Hi, thanks for having me. You gnarly, it's so exciting. I'm, I'm just thrilled to um, talk to both of you today. Um, and um, Vivo is just that. It's an incredibly alive, vivid film. Um, and there's so much to talk about behind, you know, the story, this acting, this directing, the making of. Um, and so I thought we'd just start out by um, having folks take a look at the wonderful trailer, which is hilarious, and also just kind of like reimmerse themselves in this, this beautiful story. So let's take a look at the trailer now. So super fun. Um, so maybe I will just start Kirk with that idea of like, sometimes you got to improvise. Um, I know that uh, this started from a story um, and then you came in and co-wrote the screenplay. And I'm wondering, you know, what was that first inspiration behind um, falling in love with the story? And what were some of those first steps towards improvisation? Oh, great. So um, yeah, Lynn Manuel Miranda had already started in 2009. Uh, based on the story by Peter Barsacchini. And uh, he had already written many demo songs. Uh, and what I was really struck with was the, the relationship between Andres and Vivo and how much that meant um, both to, to Lynn, but story-wise, I just felt it was so strong. And I love the idea of, of honoring somebody who's older, who's done good things for you in your life and making good on a promise to a friend. Uh, so that was what really took me um, in. And then working with Kiara Hudes, um, who worked with Lynn on In the Heights, uh, we started working on the script together. And that's when we were looking at it and she had the idea of a girl, you know, and modeled after her younger sister uh, who had a lot of energy. And really it, the idea was to bring somebody into Vivo's world because Vivo is a character who is a classically trained. He's, he's grown up in a certain way. He knows music in and out. So we wanted to throw him out of his comfort zone for the journey and put him with a partner that was the exact opposite of him. So uh, a, 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 a tween tornado is what we used to say. And then into our life walked he gnarly and Gabby was born uh, because it was started really, we had ideas and you in animation, we build designs and it's not until the voice is there that we really, we 
it's not until the voices are that we animate, but really we understand who the character is. And then we even go back and play with the design. And so he gnarly brought all of that to us and more. And so we were just uh, inspired to improvise with her performances every time we got them. Oh, very cool. That's really interesting. And gnarly, how would you say um, your own personality and your own approach sort of um, uh, fit in with uh, what Gabby's character is and how, you know what was your sort of stepping into this role like on your side? So it was great. Uh, I got to put a lot of myself into Gabby. We're both very energetic. We're both very outgoing. We're very fun. And it was so fun to do all these. The voice of Gabby was so fun with Brandon and Brandon, Kurt. They were always in the booth with me, helping me out with my um, my lines and I was always having so much fun with them and I got to put a little bit of myself I got to add Gabby it was like a mix of both of us and it was the best I always got to say some lines that I improvised on not just from the script but also from me so that was also the best part <laughs> that's fantastic that's a very generous director too that's wonderful that's really great to hear. Um, so maybe, um, you know, we have uh, this this idea of how uh, characters in a story are shaped from the narrative side, but um, maybe we can also take a look at um, all of the intensive work that goes into the animation side. And um, Kirk, perhaps I can have you talk a little bit more about that um, and we'll just kick it off with a little bit of a clip from, um, this is the behind the animation clip that you can also um, take a look at yourself later, but um, let's roll that clip and then chat. Yeah, so that is uh, amazing to see kind of the the extent of the whole live production itself. But can you tell us a little bit more, Kirk, about um, just what goes into that process? So, like, Vivo is is really so lifelike in so many ways. How do you how do you start? How where do you go? Well, it starts with a great character design, and that was designed by Joe Mosier. And um, we had that design uh, once once we started. It, it, the great thing about this project was. There were so many great songs by Lynn that artists could put on their headphones. You know, we always have the script. You usually have to give them the script and have them, we do the boards. But this was one where artists could put on their headphones and listen to music and be inspired. So they were drawing characters while they're listening to music, which is how I write. You know, I listen to music when I write. Like people, you know, it's a good way to you know, get the creativity going. So this was a way that they were inspired by the music. So in the one of a kind song that Lynn had written, uh, you know, there was, it had, it, it gave very many cues to the stylish swagger control, these kind of ideas that Joe and his design made uh, many, you know, what really inspired him. And then from there, it goes into the animation department as they build and the, and the builders who actually build those characters in 3D models. And so those models are sort of like puppets, um, but instead of like a million different strings, they have controls on the computer so that they can move their hands and they can move their face and they give them all this control. And then the next piece of the puzzle is to go into what is surfacing. And that's where the hair comes on, the fur, the cute eyes, and just the fur is just the best. You know, like in him, I think they did such a great job. He's just he, he, he's so cuddly, but um, yeah, so I feel like that's where the next step is sort of them doing, and then you bring it all together with all the animators and they become the performers, you know, they, they understand, especially in a musical number, there's that dance reference and they still have to translate that reference into the actual 3D models. It's quite, quite a process um, uh, of discovery for everybody along the way, but it's iterative and everyone builds. And I think to your point of, improv it's also collaborative you know like music yeah um i wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you work with um carlos who was on the video there the production designer and, and just like how do you you know sort of translate what your idea of sort of the choreography of the film is to someone else to the whole team yeah well carlos zaragoza was he's an amazing production designer and he actually comes with a theater background uh, so, and that's the cool thing about animation. A lot of people come from different backgrounds and artists and stuff. So he's a theater, he came from theater background and we always wanted to make this movie have this theatrical presentation like you were watching a Broadway musical. It was not meant to be uh, naturalistic or realistic. Uh, it was, you were at a, at a musical. We, we, we were clear about that. And so he designed the, the curtains opening at the beginning and the way you enter the plaza through the 
through the um, through the, the colonnade. And so it made it feel like you were in a stage and you were one of maybe the viewers, one of the tourists that would be watching the show. Uh, so that was all his idea. And then when we went to Cuba, we did a, a research trip and we went with our art department and our visual effects. And we took pictures and we were in the space and bringing back lots of details uh, that Carlos and his art team could apply to not only the structure of the buildings, the surfacing of the building, but even the light. Because uh, we have different lighting as you go from Havana to Key West into, my, into Everglades and into Miami, uh, almost like a set changes in a Broadway show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the vividness of each place is amazing. And the, the palettes and the sense, even the sense of like navigating through the plaza in Havana of like the the Malincon, the, the sort of um, seawall there, um, the lights in Miami, it's, it all just really feels like it grounds the viewer tremendously. So that's interesting the way that you talk about that also being kind of a choreography of a, of a camera and whatnot. Yeah, and we were very lucky just to say we had ro the, the world famous Roger Deakins, maybe one of the greatest living director of photography ever. So, and he was our visual consultant and he helped us a great deal with that choreographing the, the, the transitions of light, but also the transitions from the real world to our fantasy animation. Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you brought that up. I was really impressed by that um, idea of like, you know, it's, it's all credit to the animators, but also thinking about the art of cinematography is amazing. Um, so maybe we'll take a look at the next clip that just sort of further illustrates some of the things that you're talking about and we'll sort of move on through the story. So let's take a look at uh, clip two, please. Yeah, so tell us more about that. You know, you're kind of making two different films here, one in 2D, one in 3D, and also this wonderful time travel, you know, be between this nostalgic kind of flashback and the current day. Um, did it feel like two different films for you? How did you sort of navigate that? It certainly felt like that for the production team because we were almost like two different actual pipelines of making a film. So hats off to Sony Imageworks for letting us do that and for, for pulling it together. Uh, but the one thing that was always really uh, important that we we'd had going that we would know is that it wasn't earned by the story. It's, you can do anything you want, but it has to be earned by the story. And so with the Mambo Cabana, that made a lot of organic sense because it was that Vivo had no idea of what Miami would have looked like. He only lives through Andres' apartment. And therefore, when somebody would bring something up, that is his imagination. And even to Andres, I believe that that's the way Andres has been thinking about it since Marta left in 19, you know, in, in, when she left in the 60s. But so I feel that he had, we had a reason to tell the story. So it was a, a, an excuse, but it also had storytelling and that Vivo, the beauty of Andres's world is the thing that scares Vivo the most. Um, there's in that little uh, bit in there that Lynn just goes, the, the mambo, the wah-wah. I just love that little bit. Like he's so frightened and so cute. And you just, your heart goes out to him because he's like a kid. He's happy at home. He's doing, you know, he's with where he wants to be and he's about to be pushed out of his comfort zone. So uh, to do it in a beautiful way, as opposed to a scary way, uh, was, uh, was exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that like tonally, you were always able to balance that, you know, of like the the sort of scary, but also manageable and kind of cute and, you know, like dealing with that. Um, but let's take uh, a look now at um, digging deeper into Vivo and what you said in terms of uh, that character design and sort of balancing different impulses with how you wanted that character to be. So next clip, please. All right, and cutting on that, I'm gonna let you talk more about it, Kirk. <laughs> we, they're, they're, they're very, they're interesting looking animals. Yeah, so it was a, a thing that we, we were taking liberties with our, our, our Vivo, but um, I, I think that the, the really sweet thing about that was our co-director Brandon Jeffords had boarded, a uh, storyboarded, uh, which is our first part after we're at a script, that bit where baby Vivo meets Andres. And so it really was, there always was this thing, sorry. Keep clicking on that but it's not working always there was that thing that we have the um the idea that uh that on uh, that viva once we saw baby vivo all the animators because that was pretty late in our production we were in the middle of production all of a sudden everyone went oh it's baby vivo and like he became this thing that we would wait for shots we'd be like going to animation going are there baby vivo shots you know what what are we looking at we're looking at baby vivo and our day would just brighten uh yeah it's it's it was the 
Also, the, I think the other part, we wanted it to feel, because we use even animal sounds throughout, there's vocalizations, but then there's real sort of sounds designed by our sound designer. And a large part of the film is when Vivo is not communicating with language. He's communicating as an animal to, to Gabby and to get that across, because I still think that that relationship is one that we wanted to convey that they have this this, this relationship, this nonverbal relationship like you would have with your dog, that they just understand us. Like I believe your dog does. You just totally understand. So uh, tell them all the world's problems. Um, but so we wanted to get that across as well. So it had to find that balance. And I think that between the way he was designed and the way he was animated, I think we were, we, we, we hit the sweet spot on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now let's get to something that to me felt very realistic in a wonderful way, um, the depiction of Gabby. Um, and I'm excited to also bring you back into the fold, Inarly, because it is just an amazing performance. It just, your performance made the film for me um, in so many ways. Thank so you. I am going to uh, dip now into just letting Gabby take it over for mm. anybody that hasn't seen the film yet. You mm. got to share this clip um, and so let's take a look and then we'll come back with you and Arlie and Kirk and talk about the shaping of this character. So if we could roll a beat of my own drum, please. So fantastic, an amazing rendition of Missy Elliott's song. <laughs> and Arlie, let's, let's hear it from you first. Um, talk about just the song, living that character, Gabby. Um, what was it like for you? It was amazing. That character brings so much joy. It is so fun to be playing her. Her energy is just the best. The song, singing it was a blast. Me in the recording booth with Alex, he was always, we were always there like having so much fun. I was just singing the song with so much energy, putting a little bit of me and Gabby into the song, which was the best part. And it was also my first time in a recording booth for singing my, a song that I'm singing by myself. So that was really exciting, singing my first song that everyone was gonna hear in this beautiful movie. It was so much fun. And this character playing her, it was great. I got to put a little bit of myself and it just came out beautifully. <laughs> It really did. It's amazing. Did you feel like um, Gabby was like a little bit like your alter ego? Like she could kind of express herself a little bit beyond the way that you do? Or was it like right alongside where you tend to be? It's very similar. We're very, very similar. Every time my family hears Gabby, they're like, yep, that's just like you. <laughs> they're always telling me, you're just like Gabby. There is no difference like no difference besides the fact that she's 10. It, it, we're very similar in every part. That's the best part, obviously, because look at her, she's so cool. Fantastic. Now, I'm also curious, Inarli, I love like the representation of this like powerful young Latina character. Did that also re resonate with you in terms of like this whole family dynamic um, and the sort of uh, like broader Latino storyline? Yes, I am Latina, she's Latina, and it was great to know that I was gonna be playing a Latina role because there's not a lot. So if we keep putting more and more Latina role, I think that'll be the best part, like, not the best part, but the best, because it's always great to have more of every, like everything. I'm Latina, she's Latina. I, it was so much fun being like a part of that because I was thinking, wow, I'm playing a Latina role, I'm Latina. That's so similar to the fact that we're also very energetic and we're very similar personality wise. So that was great. Yeah, she's, again, this character that's just brings so much life and is so kind of self, um, self effacing in a way about like her, you know, where she has a shortcoming. And also I love the dynamic between um, the Gabby character and the scouts um, and how you set that up, Kirk. So maybe you can just talk about that a little bit. Um, and then I wanna make sure uh, we have time to go to questions. So um, let's let's kind of take that uh, story of, um, you know, just like this dynamic between young people and why that was important to you to represent. Well, I thought the one thing that we really loved the idea of, and that is that Vivo, you know, he, he is, 
without a family at the beginning of this movie after Andres passes and, you know, finding Gabby, um, this partner that he doesn't really want at the beginning and that she's got a, she has a whole too. And that together, these two pieces, even though they don't look like they should go together, actually fit really well together by the end of it. And this, the idea that it was because of a love of music. I mean, that was the theme of the music, the movie that everybody was going to be, you know, we were looking for musicians to play these roles. And one of the first things we asked Yonarly to do was just to sing. We didn't know what the song would ever end up being, but in the audition sort of sing, sing a song because we, we wanted that connection to music, which obviously, I mean, you know, it's the first time she's in a music studio. Can you believe that when she says that? It's absolutely yeah, amazing. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy. But so, um, you know, so the fact that that sort of love of music and the then the performance and you know she was 10 then, right? You know, Lee, and now you're 14. Is that correct? Is that or 10 to four? So four years, right? Yeah, I was 10 turning 11. And turning 11, and now you're right. So wow. So. <laughs> You know, she is really just and now in performing arts high school, right? So it's like, do you, really, we were before that was happening. We knew we, we, you know, that spirit that she had is not something you can you can't write like you can write the 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 the, the structure for it. But she brought it, and we just bottled it up. It was like this little energy bottle. We were just grabbing in recording sessions as she was going through, um, you know, as she was growing up right in front of our eyes. So um, the other part I think was really important was just knowing that. You know, Gabby, as far as you're saying with the sand dollars or even in just in life, you know, she's this creative kid, you know, and she's feeling alone. There's that bridge in the song where she talks about it, where it all goes all chalkboard uh, later on in the song. And, you know, she she's taken what could be insults and she's reclaimed them. And she's like, yeah, you don't don't worry. I know you want me at the three, but I'm going to be a 10. This is who I am. And I think that's such a powerful message for kids, you know, and uh, something that, uh, you know, like reclaiming uh, what you might think is a put down and uh, knowing that, you know, it's what's in your heart and where you're going and, and the way she stands strong about it always. And just the attitude that she never gives up. She falls off a boat and she laughs. I love that about Gabby. And then you gnarly, you gnarly had that kind of spirit because she was just like, oh yeah, let me at the mic. I could do this. Oh yeah, who am I with? Oh yeah, I can record this song. Like she just stepped up and just claimed it, uh, which is amazing. So yeah, absolutely. All right, I want to turn this over to our uh, wonderful viewers um, and uh, maybe just expanding on this a bit, Kirk. Um, Tiffany wanted to know, uh, Kirk, was there something you saw in Gnarly that made you pick her? You sort of talked broadly about it, but are there like specifics that really stood out to you in terms of casting? Well, we, we are producers and directors. We went to New York City and we had done a casting call, an open casting call and got a lot of uh, um, recordings. And then uh, both from Miami and New York and other, and other cities around the country. And so when we brought in uh, actresses to read for Gabby in New York, I remember when Yunarli came in, you know, she... Like it, it, the, it was a swagger, but with that sweetness and we all just fell in love. It was a, it was like, we knew that, you know, we have the picture, like a drawing of a picture of, of our character, uh, like near us. And then when we start to hear it and you meet it personally, but then when we go back to editorial, we take the voice recordings and you put it to the picture. So it's now on it. And that's when you really know. And when we had it, our editor was like, yep, this is her. This is her. everyone down the line was like, yep, that's Gabby. Uh, so it really, I, like I say, it was that, that sort of energy and the positivity and that joyousness that we wanted, uh, because he, she's a life raft for Vivo at that moment. He's, he's going through the stages of grief. And so having someone that, you know, would have so much love and the other little thing I love, and I love the way she acted it is just the way she becomes so romantically involved in delivering this love song. It's like so beyond her years, but she's super touched by this love song that she reads. And I remember when, when you really first read those lines, uh, when she first read the letter and how much that means and how she knows that this woman marked is waiting and Gabby's just like, Oh, we're doing this. And, and you're like, yep, I know it. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. So Kriti sends the question, what did you learn from Gabby? Have you brought any part of her to your own life? And I would put that to both of you. Maybe Inarli, do you want to start and then? Uh, for Gabby, I've learned to always look at the bright side in any bad situation. Like when they were almost, when Gabby was 
on the other side of the door and Vivo had to go. She's like, take this bracelet, remember me, finish this love, this mission for love, finish it for both of us. And she just always looked at the bright side. And that I feel like you should always have on yourself. Don't always look at the bad side, look at the bright side, like Gabby, be optimistic. And that I've always taken from her. I took that from her. Nice. And what about you, Kirk? Oh, recently I actually have, because I have eight year old twins and there was a cop opportunity to talk about feeling bullied. Uh, one was feeling bullied by something. And so it was an opportunity to talk about bouncing the beat of your own drum and that, that stuff, the way Gabby handles it, it's not, she doesn't fight back, but she's going to get through it. It's just the spirit of who she is and it's not going to destroy who she is, you know, and it's, it's not going to be, it's not really a reflection upon her because she knows who she is and she's okay with having her own seat on the bus. That's the favorite lyric of one of the, uh, there's many that Lynn's written, but that one in particular is so great to reclaim that sort of feeling and to be like, I got my own seat on the bus. You know, that I always been a mean on and us. That to me is like a, a real, it's a rallying cry. I feel really good about that one. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Okay, we have a question from Gracie, who wants to know, how do you write the script with someone else writing the songs? Oh. Well, that was really interesting because we, I did write with uh, Kiara Udes, who had written the book for In the Heights, and she's a close friend and partner with Lynn, so I had that connection. But Lynn was, this is a very unique film because he was not only the singer-songwriter, but he was also the lead actor. So there was no way he didn't know what was going on in the movie because he was recording the dialogue for the lead. Um, and so we always envisioned that this was a musical. We were going to have music throughout the entire thing, and Lynn was loving that and on board with it and super helpful and generous that he would be able to take scenes for instance keep the beat was a scene that we had in the film for many couple of years that worked well as just a dialogue scene worked really well and he we were looking for a song in the middle and he sort of focused it on that area he took the scene he wrote the song and kept the sweet spot of the scene so he was to that point is he was doing storytelling. It was back and forth. Sometimes he would lead in the dance and sometimes he would follow. Um, sometimes we would be waiting for the song to fill the space or sometimes we would have had already created the scene or sort of ghost written the thematics of what it should be. And then he would write the song to that. So uh, it was it was definitely, uh, I think also because of like his connection, it was so deep because of also playing the lead. Uh, it was pretty great, pretty awesome actually. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's does such an amazing job on so many levels. All right, uh, I think we probably only have time for one more question, but I'm going to do a bit of a mashup that overlaps. Knessa asks, asks, what is your message to kids seeing this movie? And then uh, Kylan wants to know, what do you hope younger audiences take away from FIFO? So I feel like maybe the first one is for you, Inarli. What is your message to kids seeing this movie? My message for kids seeing this movie is to always follow their dreams and to not care what other people say about them. Like Martha, she followed her dreams and that they should always do that. And like Gabby, she does not let anyone bring her down. She, like she says, she bounced to the beat of her own drum and kids should always do that. They should not care what other people say and just be them no mm. matter what. Fantastic. You do such a great job, both through Gabby and through yourself being here present of doing that and modeling that in gnarly. So thank you. Um, thank and you. then Kirk, uh, back to the question, what do you hope younger audiences take away from Vivo? I, well, I personally, what happened for the course of the film was when we had mid making it and then we went through the pandemic and that's when Keep the Beat was, was written. And that idea and that thematic of leaning into the curve, that when the road bends, you lean into the curve, that there is second acts and so kids reach things that are tough and a little bit difficult, but like Vivo and Gabby leaning into the curve and finding a friendship. I think that is the most important thing is that found friendships um, really get you through. And, and I think Vivo had is a gift. He was doing something really sweet and honorable for his friend and the gift he found was Gabby. And I think that is a great message that when you do things with love in your heart, you'll hopefully be given a gift and that might be a great new friend. Absolutely. Well, this film is definitely a gift and we are all grateful for it. I mean, it's just hilarious, gorgeous, beautiful. Um, and the music is so much fun. Thank you all. Um, 
I'm thrilled again that it's uh, at the very top of uh, Netflix's most popular films right now, but um, please everybody spread the word. It's, it's just a, a wonderful film for um, everybody to watch together. Um, and um, just let folks know we're going to have these uh, this conversation um, also on our uh, YouTube and other um, social channels. So um, people, you can direct um, folks to the recordings um, as we will do. Um, but please share the word. And thank you so much, Kirk and Inarly. It was a wonderful conversation, and we so appreciate um, you sharing your talents with all of us. It's great. I just have to say I want to thank Kurt and the whole Sony production because they have taught me so much and it was so fun recording with them and being a part of this movie. And I wanna thank all of you so much because it was the best time working on this movie. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, everyone that was helping me through everything of this movie it was the best. <laughs> the best in our league. Gosh, we are. <laughs> Fantastic. We're excited to see what all of you are going to do next. Thank you again to Netflix and to Sony. And um, thank you all for, for watching and joining the conversations and posing your questions and share Vivo out in the world. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you.